Welcome back for part four of unit 10. This is the last part. It should be the shortest part. We're going to discuss high-risk labor and birth. Um, and if you look at your course objectives for um, this part of unit 10, which would be under number C, we've already discussed all the medical management. So we don't have to recover like oxytocin induction in that. Um, we can move right on to some of the more common um, conditions like preterm labor and birth. We can look at dystocia, which just means a dysfunctional labor. We'll look very briefly at post-date birth, which is birth after 42 weeks gestational age. And then some of the obstetric emergencies. Some of them are more common than others. Um, hopefully you don't see too many of them in your career, but shoulder dystocia does happen. Um, we're also going to talk about prolapsed umbilical cord. Let me just throw something else in there. Um, prolapse cord is not common, but it does happen, and there are a lot of things that the nurse needs to know about it. Um, in case you do encounter it, you can save a baby's life. Um, uterine rupture, again, hopefully not something you encounter frequently, but it does happen. Um, and again, the nurse needs to act quickly. Amniotic fluid embolism, not common at all. Um, typically only diagnosed on autopsy, so we'll only talk briefly about that. There's not that much you can really do. Um, except get help and, you know, maybe assist with intubation. Um, and then meconium fluid, which is, uh, you know, in about 10% of deliveries, you'll see that babies pass meconium in the fluid, um, and just a few things that the nurse needs to know about that. So we'll move on. Our first discussion under this topic is going to be preterm labor and preterm birth. And they are defined as labor and or birth that occur before 37 weeks gestation, but after 20 weeks gestation. Now we know that between 20 and 23 weeks, we really are looking at a pre-viable neonate in most cases. You may hear reference in literature to um, neonates at 22 weeks, and you might be able to sustain life for a little while, but the statistics um, on intact survival at 22 weeks are really dismal and almost non-existent. So most people will consider 23 weeks to be a viable uh, neonate. And even at 23 weeks, things don't look great. Every gestational, every week of gestational age you get after um, 23 weeks, the, the prognosis improves. So we're going to talk about the different categories um, of preterm babies. We have our very preterm infants. And these are under 32 weeks. In most cases, um, Wherever mom was planning to deliver, if she starts to go into labor under 32 weeks, she'll be counseled to go to a um, higher level, a hospital that has a higher level of neonatal intensive care. So their NICU might be classified as a level three, which is what Capital Health has under 32 weeks. Um, those babies are at extreme risk for um, all kinds of complications, including retinopathy and pulmonary disease. Um, something called neck, which is necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, they're at risk for cerebral palsy. They're at risk for a lot of different developmental disabilities. Um, so it really is important to get them the appropriate level of care. So next, after um, very preterm infants, we have our moderately preterm infants. And these babies are somewhere between 32 and 34 weeks. gestational age, which is what that GA stands for. And these babies are still quite a bit at risk. They're small. Um, they have trouble maintaining their blood sugar. They have trouble maintaining their body temperature. They usually aren't particularly good feeders. They kind of tucker out. Um, and they use a lot of oxygen to do things that a term baby does um, sort of effortlessly, almost. So those are your moderately preterm. Um, your late pretermers, we call them the great imposters. Sorry, I'm not typing. Um, these are the ones that are maybe 34 to 36 and 6 sevenths, we'll say. And it can be very easy to think that these babies are fine and don't need a lot of support which is why they're called the great imposters. 
Um, a baby at 36 and 6 sevenths might weigh six and a half pounds, um, but it still might have trouble maintaining a blood sugar, maintaining a body temperature. It still might have trouble feeding well. Um, it will be more susceptible to higher levels of bilirubin. Um, and we really need to watch out for these babies too. Sometimes these babies will be in the neonatal intensive care and sometimes they'll be on the mother baby unit. Um, you know, it sort of depends on where you work and how much oversight you can give those kids. But um, those babies, really, you kind of need to um, keep an eye on. They might not be as sick or as tiny as the other pretermers, but that it is important. And it is important to um, really address preterm labor and preterm birth in a way that's effective um, because it is a significant cause of infant mortality and infant morbidity. Um, <clears throat> and we did see an increase in the last 20 years. Now, some of that is because we have better testing um, that would indicate a problem where a baby might need to be delivered emergently before term. Some of it is because we have more multiples, and some of it is because we have more public health issues. Um, so we'll sort of explore some of the risk factors for that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of preterm labor and preterm delivery. Um, and it's not completely understood what causes some women to go into preterm labor and not others, just like we don't completely understand what causes um, term labor to begin. But we do have some associated uh, factors that contribute to the incidence, and one of them is inflammation. And some of these low-grade infections. So when mom has... Um, like bacterial vaginosis, sometimes a UTI will make things um, get started. Um, we can sometimes see like uh, even like poor dental health with the low levels of inflama inflammation that you get with that. Um, moms who have these like levels of low-grade inflammation that are more or less chronic um, will have the release of inflammatory chemicals including cytokines and that will a lot of times impact um, whether or not they have preterm labor. Um, maternal stress and then release of cortisol. Also fetal stress. Um, and this is why you see babies of smokers a lot of times are born earlier. Um, they'll release more cortisol in response to that hypoxic insult that they get with the cigarette smoke. Um, and that will very often. We know that moms that are under severe psychological stress, um, mothers whose partners maybe are um, incarcerated or partners who um, aren't supportive of them, mothers who are of low socioeconomic status, these moms have much higher incidence of um, preterm labor and preterm delivery. Um, uterine over distension. And here's where your multiples um, figure in. Your diabetic pregnancies. As you have those bigger babies, polyhydramnios, which is an increase in amniotic fluid. Anything that over descends the uterus definitely um, is going to predispose mom to a preterm delivery. Um, and then sometimes we see like abruption as a, as a cause um, of preterm delivery. And we've already discussed placental abruption, so we're really not going to talk too much about that. But that is some of, those, those are some of the um, contributory um, processes that can stimulate a preterm labor. Okay, so next we're going to talk about risk factors. And these don't directly contribute, but they do um, put mom at higher risk. And first off, we're going to go with multiple gestations. Each uh, additional fetus over singleton pregnancy decreases the length of pregnancy by about three weeks. Um, but it varies. You can see moms deliver at 39 weeks with twins. Uh, rarely will you get triplets to term. Um, so your higher order multiples, we're usually looking at your very preterm infants. But multiples, definitely. Um, for multiple reasons. You have more placenta pushing out um, cortisol. You have a high over distension of the uterus. You have a lot of things going on. Um, okay, so prior preterm birth. If you've had one early baby 
you're at risk for having another. And this really, really ups your risk. It's probably the single biggest factor, um, risk factor for preterm delivery. So if you're looking at a mom and she says, yeah, all my babies are early. Um, I had one at 34 weeks, one at 32 weeks. You need to really um, target her for some um, prevention of preterm delivery for the next baby. Um, and then we have any kind of uterine anomalies. This would be your fibroids or um, maybe bicornuate uterus, which is a uterus that has like two compartments to it, like two separate horns. Um, but anything that might be wrong with the uterus and anything that might be wrong with the cervix. And by that, we could be talking about people who've had cervical cancer or they've had abnormal pap smears and they've been treated with either a cone biopsy or a LEAPS procedure. Um, but anytime you hear of mom having abnormal paps or treatment for, you know, early cervical cancer, or fibroids or anything like that, um, start thinking about preterm delivery. Um, those infections and periodontal disease. Um, UTIs, um, recurrent um, BV, chlamydia, gonorrhea, your STDs do play a role, and that's from that low level of inflammation that we talked about. Um, Preterm rupture of membranes, obviously, and that's also associated with infections. So your PP, uh, PPROM people, um, obviously at risk for preterm delivery. We have psychological stress. So if mom is reporting to you a lot of stressors in her life, a lot of psychosocial um, stuff that's going on, you need to target it because the constant release of stress hormones, the catecholamines and the cortisol, do impact um, her risk of a preterm delivery. And we have domestic violence. For two reasons, you can have abdominal trauma and you have that emotional stress that goes with it. So domestic violence is another risk factor. We need to assess women at every um, at certain intervals, definitely with every hospitalization, but even um, prior to that, in the prenatal period, we really need to assess and you need to do it tactfully and carefully and you need to do it for every woman. Um, any kind of vaginal bleeding, even the stuff that seems more or less benign is an indication that something might be going on that would predispose mom to a preterm delivery. Um, the lack of social support goes with psychosocial. And then we have smoking, drugs, alcohol, all of those lifestyle choices. Um, they all create a stressful environment for the baby and they are associated with other um, uh, risk behaviors and self-care deficits. So that definitely. And we look at things like um, family history and if mom says yeah all my mother's babies were early too I was a preemie my sister was a preemie um, you're looking at her as somebody who might um, deliver early and then any chronic health disorders um, obviously if you have hypertension if you have you know all the stuff we talked about we talked about the high-risk antipartum period so those are our risk factors so how do we know that we have preterm labor going on? Well, obviously the patient is going to complain of persistent contractions, um, regular contractions, painful contractions, and those contractions will result in cervical change. So if you put somebody on the monitor and you notice that they're having contractions every five to 10 minutes, um, you ask, do you feel those? And you're gonna palpate to see what the intensity are. Um, and you're gonna look at the cervical change. Now, you know, a textbook might define a Braxton Hicks contraction as lasting 20 to 30 seconds, but sometimes they last a little longer. Um, your big hallmark is going to be cervical change. So if you have any dilation of the cervix prior to 37 weeks, um, including, uh, well, anything, like a one centimeter, or if you have effacement, like 80% effacement um, early on, if you have a transvaginal ultrasound that shows cervical shortening, um, the cervix gets shorter, or funneling, which means that the external os is maybe closed or one centimeter, but the internal os is dilating. It kind of makes this like funnel effect. Um, so if you see cervical changes, that is um, 
really by definition you can make a diagnosis or the doctor can make a diagnosis of preterm labor. Um, rupture of membranes, if the water breaks, you know that you are dealing with um, basically a preterm labor situation. Um, even though that's covered under a separate category, um, if you have contractions, cervical change, and then the water breaks, we have progressed now to preterm labor. Um, positive fetal fibronectin, FFN. So let's talk about fetal fibronectin a little bit. Straighten that out. Um, okay, so fetal fibronectin is this like protein um, that's important in the it's part of the seal between the membranes and the um, uterus. So when you can detect fetal fibronectin in the vaginal fluid, in the vaginal vault, um, there is a chance that mom is going into preterm labor. However, I just want to point attention to the fact it's got very poor positive predictive value. In other words, if you get a positive result on this test, your chances of delivering in the next two weeks are really about 25 to 40 percent, depending on whose study you read. Um, and the reason for that is that there are a lot of things that can give you a false positive fetal fibronectin. And one of those things would be like intercourse with your partner in some recent time period. So we always ask mom, have you had sex in the last 48 hours? And if she says yes, we usually don't even do one. Um, if she's had any digital exams, if there's been anything that might interrupt that seal just even a tiny bit, you're going to get a false positive. But we will still watch the mom with a positive fetal fibronectin um, longer than we'll watch one with a negative one because it has a very good um, negative predictive value. And what that means is that it'll, it's a very good test at telling us who's not going to go into labor and deliver. So you have about, if you get a negative uh, fetal fibronectin, your chances of delivery in the next 14 days is less than, sorry, 5%. And I want to say that the statistics that I was quoted initially when we started using this where I work was less than 2%. And it just kind of depends on the um, literature. So it's a really good predictor of who's not going to deliver, or, you know, better than a lot of things. Fetal fibronectin really changed the picture in terms of how we give care in the hospital. We used to have a lot of people who would be in the hospital for preterm labor for weeks and sometimes months getting tocolytic therapy, which is now, um, we'll kind of discuss that. And that has really changed because a lot of them, if they had been given a fetal fibronectin, we would have found that it was negative and um, we would have sent them home, which is what we do now. So they would not have been managed in the hospital. And that's good because, you know, you don't want a mom on bed rest for six weeks or eight weeks. Um, you don't want to give necessarily steroids to everybody or tocolytics. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about how tocolysis has changed over the years too. Um, but that's your fetal fibronectin, and that's one of the tests that we do. So the medical management for preterm labor is kind of controversial, and the science is evolving on this. Um, but the first thing that most doctors will order typically is bed rest. They might even order bed rest in Trendelenburg to take pressure off of the cervix. Um, and, you know, it's an easy therapy to order, but it's not necessarily benign. Um, and the evidence has not really shown that the outcomes are better with prolonged bed rest. Um, if you are going to have a woman on bed rest, remember there are all those complications of immobility. And just because mom is 26 or 35 or um, even 19 doesn't mean that she can't have complications of immobility. So we can have things like um, DDT with prolonged bed rest. Um, women are hypocoagulable, and we have had cases of DVT, and they have progressed to pulmonary embolism. And then mom ends up in a unit, and we've taken something that was... Um, one problem and turned it into something bigger. Mom gets muscle atrophy. This is where you want to have maybe a physical therapy consult. Um, do bids, bedside physical therapy. And remind mom that every so often she should be doing like calf pumps and quad setting and um, moving her legs up and down in the bed. Um, you can have cardiovascular deconditioning. So finally, when this mom does deliver and goes home and she's going back, sorry, we want that to be deconditioning, not reconditioning. Um, she's going to feel a little wimpy and weak, and it's going to take her a while to get back into um, 
you know, feeling better, you can get um, increased stress on the family and on mom. A woman who is in preterm labor, um, who is told to stay on bed rest, who has two other children who are small and need her attention, is a woman who's going to feel very helpless um, to take care of her family. It is going to create a strain on the family, particularly, uh, excuse me, particularly if that mom has um, very little support, if she doesn't have somebody who can help her with the kids. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. Um, another thing that we do for preterm labor, a lot of times they come into triage, they're contracting. The easiest thing to do is to just start an IV and bolus them with a big bag of LR. And sometimes that will knock out your contractions. Um, dehydration does cause contractions. So these moms come in, it's always in the summer, July, August, whatever. They've been at the pool all day. Um, they don't necessarily feel dehydrated, but they haven't been drinking and they're contracting every two to three minutes. You bolus them with a little um, IV fluid and it will decrease the contractions. It also decreases the ratio of um, with the concentration of oxytocin in the blood if mom has circulating oxytocin. So hydrate the mom. Sometimes you'll um, get her to stop. Now we used to just, every time mom would have a run of contractions, like I said, we used to have patients who were in the hospital for weeks and weeks and weeks, um, and we're giving them terbutaline, say, every four hours or whatever we're giving them. Uh, magnesium sulfate was another drug, and we would just bolus them with LR constantly, and we were putting them into pulmonary edema. You can fluid overload a patient. Um, so this is a strategy you want to use with caution. Like I said, if mom comes in dehydrated because she was sitting out in the sun at Sesame Place all day, um, yeah, you know, by all means, give her a nice big bag of fluid and tell her, drink, 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 and give her lots of, um, you know, PO fluid. But if she's somebody who's in the hospital, you want to watch the amount of fluid that you're giving somebody IV. Um, antibiotics. If mom has some underlying infection, if she's one of those people who has um, UTI that progresses to pilo, nephritis, or if she has um, any kind of BV, you might want to prophylax her with the antibiotics, and that'll keep her from, hopefully, from having that stimulation. Um, and then let's talk about tocolysis. And tocolysis is the medical um, treatment to stop contractions. Um, so I'm going to actually give that sort of its own thunder um, instead of just putting it at the bottom of the list because tocolysis is something that you'll see on test questions. Now here's the deal. As I said, we used to do a lot of therapy with terbutaline, with procardia, with indocin, with mag, and it was long-term therapy. We wanted to keep mom pregnant for as long as possible. However, um, here, let's go up here. It isn't associated with better outcomes, um, especially not as a long-term therapy. It wasn't particularly effective enough at stopping labor to outweigh the risks. And when we discuss each particular medication, you're going to see these are not benign. This isn't Tylenol that we're giving people. They are strong medications with very um, significant adverse effects. So tocolysis has not, um, it does not have the popularity that it once did. Okay? And we're not seeing better outcomes with our babies as a result of it. Okay? So um, the current thinking... Uh, support short-term use so that we can administer steroids. And even though we haven't talked about steroids yet, we have sort of introduced the topic a little bit. Steroids help give us some fetal lung maturity. Um, we can also treat with magnesium sulfate for 24 hours. Um, for fetal neuroprotection because that mag um, has a protective effect against cerebral palsy and um, intraventricular hemorrhage, the bleeding between the ventricles of the brain. Um, and so we want to get maybe those two uh, therapies in. So you might use your tocolysis. Now, the preferred agent at this point in time is magnesium sulfate because you kill two birds with one stone. You can't give Procardia. Procardia is a calcium channel blocker. I'll talk about each drug separately, but you can't give Procardia with mag sulfate. Um, you really, it's, 
you know, MAG can cause some pulmonary edema. Um, so you have to be very cautious using terbutaline with MAG sulfate because terbutaline can cause um, a lot of cardiovascular and pulmonary complications. Um, so very often what you're going to see when somebody comes in and we think that delivery is going to happen, we'll try to delay that delivery um, with a course of magnesium sulfate. And maybe our primary um, purpose for that could be fetal neuroprotection. Um, but it does stop contractions. It decreases the irritability of the uterine muscle. Um, and then we're going to treat with corticosteroids. And the protocol that I am used to is betamethasone. 12.5 milligrams IM injection. Let me tell you something about betamethasone. If you've ever had it, you know exactly where you got it because you could point to that spot for a month. It makes people that sore. Warn your patients before you get it. You need a big muscle for this. Ventrogluteal. I mean, you'll see people give it in the dorsal gluteal because that's what they learned in nursing school. I have taught you something different um, based on evidence-based practice, but you need a big muscle. This is not a mus This is not something you can do in the deltoid. Um, you want the vastus lateralis or the ventrogluteal muscle for betamethasone, okay? And this is for fetal lung maturity. So your mag sulfate therapy, um, usually you're going to do kind of a similar protocol um, that for what you do for um, preeclampsia. And that's going to be a 4 gram, oh, sorry, bolus followed by one to two grams an hour. Um, and, you know, you're going to have a standardized bag for that. This is a high-risk medication. Again, it's the same precautions that we're looking at. Um, the big difference with mag sulfate is we're not now worried about seizures, so you're maybe not doing seizure precautions. But you're still, um, when you go into that room, checking I and O to make sure you have urine output. You're still going to check... Um, your DTRs to make sure you don't get absent or uh, diminished reflexes. You're going to check a blood pressure because mag sulfate as a side effect will reduce the blood pressure. And if you've got a woman who doesn't have a hypotension issue, um, you're going to watch for a maternal hypotension. Um, you have to watch your fluid balance very carefully because a side effect of magnesium sulfate is um, pulmonary edema. Um, and you're also going to assess level of consciousness. Okay. <laughs> This is where um, smart pumps are great, but you have to be smarter than the pump sometimes when you're doing that four gram bolus. Um, we worked out the math. If you have a concentration where you work, you're gonna see the same concentration over and over again because we don't want mistakes here. As I said, um, we had a woman who was in for preterm labor and the nurse that I was working with almost killed her um, by failing to set the volume to be infused on the pump. It was before we had smart pumps, but still, um, you want to make sure that you are giving exactly 4 grams and then you stop. You're giving 1 to 2 grams an hour. And to make sure that you are not making an error, two nurses, two RNs, should be co-signing um, that they initiated the bolus, that they changed the rate. Anytime you hang a new bag, you should have two RNs who determine that, yes, you are giving this medication safely. So that's mag sulfate um, and the way that we use it in preterm labor. Okay. So corticosteroids, we've already talked about. They are for fetal lung maturity. Usually, I see them given two doses, um, 24 hours apart. And if you can keep mom pregnant another day to give them a chance to work, that is fabulous. Um, because that really will um, sort of help the baby breathe better when they come out. Now... Um, the thing that you want to remember is that steroids alter blood glucose and WBC. Um, so if you're also treating mom with antibiotics or whatever and you look and this white count goes way up, and oh no, she's got an infection, no, that's normal for steroids, but it should be interpreted, um, you know, your doctor should see that lab report and kind of know. Obviously if mom's running a fever, if you're seeing other signs and symptoms of infection, foul smelling fluid, whatever. Um, it will correlate with an even higher white blood count. Um, 
but do know that steroids will alter the blood glucose. So we'll probably do some finger sticks on mom, and we may even need to cover her with insulin, even though she is not diabetic, um, because of the corticosteroids. So that is the typical protocol. Now there are some other medications that we can give for tocolysis, and one of them is terbutaline. Um, now terbutaline is a medication that used to be used fairly commonly, um, and as we talk about it, we'll discuss why it might not be used um, as much anymore. It's also known as brethine, and as the name would suggest, it's been used as a bronchodilator. It is a beta adrenergic agonist. Um, okay, so brethine um, or terbutaline, we used to start it as a sub-Q dose, and then um, as mom responded to it, we could convert it to an oral medication, PO, and then we would send mom home um, on brethine, and she would continue that until her doctor told her to stop taking it somewhere closer to term than wherever she was when we started. Um, okay, so it has some um, effects on smooth muscle. And it will relax the uterus um, and stop contractions. That's its main effect, and it is effective to an extent. Um, however, it has a lot of side effects and adverse effects that we might not want. Um, and ACOG studied this and determined that the um, risk of adverse effects did not was not justified um, by an increase in good outcomes for babies. Now, um, I think when the thinking was is that you were saving babies from all the complications of prematurity, um, that there was a certain amount of risk we would tolerate. And most pregnant women tolerated terbutaline fairly well. Um, they didn't like the side effects necessarily, um, but they didn't all have to go to the ICU for pulmonary edema. Um, however, some did. Um, so let's start to discuss the side effects and adverse effects. So under side effects, we have an increase in heart rate, which may or may, may not become tachycardia. Mom would report palpitations, um, sometimes insomnia, restlessness, nervousness. So it was sort of like if you gave mom a six-pack of Red Bull and she drank it really, really fast, that's sort of what terbutaline would make her feel like. Excuse me one minute. Okay, sorry about that. Um, but I'm back and things are a little quieter. Um, these would be the things that mom would report. The adverse events were pretty significant. Um, you could end up with tachycardia in both mom and baby. Um, and you could end up with arrhythmias in both mom and baby. Um, you could see pulmonary edema, and that was the big risk. Um, you could have hypokalemia, which would contribute to your arrhythmias. And you can actually have myocardial ischemia. So you could have coronary events um, with terbutaline. And they weren't every patient, they weren't every time, but I do remember a mom with triplets being sent um, to the ICU with this, and of course the people in the ICU didn't really want her because she was pregnant with triplets and having preterm labor, so what were they going to do with her? And we didn't want her because she was having uh, pulmonary edema and arrhythmias, and we didn't know what to do with her. And so that was sort of a, you know, a very complicated case. Um, so that is terbutaline. Now, um, there are some really good uses of terbutaline when you need to relax the muscles of the uterus very quickly. For example, if you're doing an external version um, and you want that uterus to stay kind of quiet while you're doing that so that you can manipulate the baby within the uterus from the outside. You might want terbutaline if you have a tachycystole pattern on your electronic fetal monitor and you see lots of contractions. Um, and our non-reassuring fetal heart rate, terbutaline would be a great medication in that instance. If you had a uterine rupture, or if you had um, any other complication where um, you needed to relax the smooth muscle of the uterus, you could use a subcutaneous dose of brethine. Um, you just want to be careful, like I said, what you would need to do before you give brethine is to um, listen to the apical heart rate it must be an apical. It cannot be the number that you get from the blood pressure cuff. Um, you're listening for rhythm also while you're listening for the rate. But if the rate is higher um, than 120, you don't give that medication. Okay, so listen to breath sounds. And if there's any sign that there might be fluid in the lungs, 
um, you're obviously going to hold this medication because this mom can go into pulmonary edema. Um, assess mom for chest pain, shortness of breath, um, palpitations, anything that would tell you that something is not right with mom, that she's got some kind of cardiovascular compromise. Um, and you're going to assess the fetal heart rate. Um, and you're going to hold that medication if the heart rate is over 160. Um, so there's a whole lot of things that you want to do. You also want to monitor I know. These moms actually go into fluid overload very, very quickly. The risk is higher with multiples um, because they've already got so much excess fluid volume. Um, and that's your risk factor for pulmonary edema. Um, so that, you know, that's brethene um, or terbutaline. Again, when ACOG did the studies, they found that it really was not sufficiently effective at preventing preterm delivery or at um, giving you better outcomes for neonatal health or um, neonatal maturity. So um, the recommendation now, you can use it as a short-term therapy um, to delay um, birth long enough to get your steroids in, especially if you have a mom that's contraindicated for magnesium sulfate, um, or you can use it in those other indications that I talked about. Um, but the willy-nilly use of terbutaline on everybody, um, not so much. Another therapy we might do, I think I talked about IV hydration. Um, you might give that mom a bag of fluid. Again, you're going to watch this. If you're also giving terbutaline, you want to watch that you're not going to fluid overload this patient. Um, but certainly in the summer months when you get those um, people in and it's August and they haven't had anything to drink all day, they've been standing online at Sesame Place, um, taking care of their other two little kids, they get a little dehydrated, they'll contract. Um, so you give them a bag or two of normal saline or LR, and boom, your contractions go away. So that is another treatment you can use. Um, we have other medications. You can give um, nifedipine or nicardipine. Um, I haven't seen nicardipine used. Um, I have seen nifedipine used. It's also known as procardia. Um, and procardia is a calcium channel blocker. You can't use it at the same time as you use mag. Um, again, it relaxes the smooth muscle of the uterus by working on the calcium channel. Um, you're going to hold for SBP less than 90 um, or heart rate greater than 120. Um, and you're going to educate mom, don't stand up too fast. They get a little orthostatic hyper, hypotension. They might get some flushing and a headache. Um, that's your procardia. Again, you're using it in the short term um, to delay delivery until you can get steroids on board. Uh, most of the time, though, magnesium sulfate is your preferable agent because of the fetal neuroprotection um, component of it, even though it's a little bit riskier. Um, so you would use procardia in some moms, but not all. Um, your last agent that we're going to well, we're going to talk about two more agents really quickly. The first one we're going to talk about is your prostaglandin um, inhibitors, also known as your NSAIDs. In particular, we use endomethacin or indocin, and we use these in those early, oops, sorry, endocin. Having all kinds of trouble with this spell correct. Okay, especially when I don't act fast enough to exit out. Um, okay, so indocin um, works by blocking the prostaglandin synthesis. And that's important because we know that labor, um, one of the factors that initiates labor is the um, production and response to prostaglandins. So if we give these NSAIDs um, at gestational age less than 32 weeks, we can sometimes um, stop preterm labor. Um, the big thing is, is you don't want to continue it after 32 weeks because it can cause premature closure of the ductus arteriosus. Um, in fact, when your baby is a born baby in the NICU, if they have a patent ductus arteriosus or PDA, remember that the neonatal circulation is supposed to switch off at that first deep breath when the pressures change inside the pulmonary um, anyway, you're supposed to get that ductus to close. If the ductus doesn't close, you can use indocin for that. So um, that's the way to help you remember. You're not going to use indocin long term either. 
So that's um, when you inhibit prostaglandin synthesis with the NSAIDs. That's what that's about. Now the last drug that I'm going to mention is called McKenna. That's the trade name for it. It is hydroxyprogesterone caparate. Um, it is an injectable medication. Um, it doesn't, it's not a tocolytic. It doesn't stop contractions. Um, but it increases the amount of circulating progesterone, which remember, progesterone was the chemical that sort of quieted everything down. Um, and who's a candidate? Certainly not going to use this if a woman presents in labor for the first time, um, but somebody who has a history of preterm delivery is a good candidate for a McKenna. Um, and it's the only drug approved by the FDA for the treatment of preterm, um, for the prevention of preterm delivery. It is an injection. You need a large muscle, um, and it has been shown to be effective. The other investigational use, I think, when you have shortening of the cervix, and I think the jury's still out on that. I'm not sure. I think it was something that was tried and may not have been considered effective. But when you have that um, preterm shortening of the cervix with funneling, the progesterone might quiet things down enough. Um, but that are those are your medications for preterm labor. It's probably enough of a discussion. So we'll move on.
So we're going to talk about dystocia. It's a lot less lengthy than preterm labor. Um, dystocia is just a dysfunctional, sorry, labor pattern. Fall into roughly two types. Hypertonic means you're getting a lot of contractions and they're strong enough, but they're uncoordinated like a Charlie horse as opposed to um, like flexing your calf on purpose. Okay. So you're getting these muscle spasmic kind of contractions and they're not really super effective at dilating the cervix. They don't pull on those muscle fibers the way they should. And more commonly, you will see hypotonic contractions and these are contractions that might be perceived as painful to the patient, um, but they aren't terribly intense um, to palpation, usually getting mild or mild to moderate and they're not really effective at dilating the cervix. So if you put in an IUPC or an intrauterine pressure catheter, um, you get these little tiny wimpy contractions and they're maybe going up 20 or 30 millimeters of mercury from the baseline and that's not going to be enough um, pressure to put on that cervix to affect delivery. So um, what do we do about these? Well, for your hypotonics, it's mostly going to be augmentation of labor. I'll feed you in a sec, don't worry. Um, we're going to give oxytocin or we're going to rupture membranes. And that's usually enough to really get things going in the right direction. So those are some of the medical things that um, you can do for dystocia, but really this is sort of where the nurse can um, make a big difference. If you think about um, babies that are in sort of an unfavorable position, like an occipit, um, occipital posterior position, um, helping mom get into those hands and knees positions or helping her turn using the peanut ball, if um, baby's not descending, um, helping mom stay upright, walking, using the birthing ball, um, those kind of things. If stress is making um, an impact on labor progress, and it can, those stress hormones, um, the catecholamines very often will oppose um, birth um, and normal labor. Um, labor support, pain relief, um, those are things that the nurse can do um, to help mom. Getting her in the jacuzzi, getting her, giving her a back rub, help, showing dad how to do these things um, for her because you can't be one-on-one -on -one all the time with your patients necessarily and you may be expected to do lots of other things. Um, but those might be some things that you can do for mom. So relaxation exercises. We did mention psyche as one of the four Ps. Um, and sometimes positions that open the pelvic outlet, um, like squatting, um, using that squatting bar, that can be great for dystocia. Um, encouragement, and sometimes, you know, what they're calling dystocia, um, presently ACOG has now decided that six centimeters should be um, maybe where we determine that active labor begins for some patients. And I don't want to confuse you. If you see it on an exam, we're still going with those textbook de definition of four to seven centimeters as being an active um, phase of first stage. But, you know, maybe we want to reserve judgment on whether there was failure to progress until we get to at least six and then see what happens. Um, so encouragement and support. And patience. A lot of it is just patience. Um, but all of these things, hopefully, um, will be things that you can use to um, help mom with a difficult labor pattern. And we're on to our next topic, which is precipitous delivery. And as I told you, all of these topics are kind of short compared to preterm labor, which took a lot of time. Precipitous delivery is simply defined as labor that lasts less than three hours. And this is common, um, well, not common, but it happens, especially with your mole tips. If you have a small baby and a wide pelvis, you tend to get quicker labors. Um, precipitous delivery can become a problem if the birth is like sort of an explosive birth um, or if it's unattended by a provider. You might be the one that attends this delivery. We call them bibs, baby in bed. Um, and I think we all have some funny bib stories. If you ask a labor nurse when you're in clinical about the babies in the beds, they'll probably tell you one or two. Um, but a labor that lasts less than three hours um, can be sort of explosive for the mom and the baby, especially if the second stage happens very, very quickly and is unsupported. Um, the things that we worry about are perineal 
lacerations for mom, um, sometimes cervical lacerations. So pelvic trauma, um, <clears throat> that can happen with a very rapid delivery. For the baby, we worry more about injury. And you can um, worry about, like, especially to the head. Um, and in extreme cases where mom has very forcefully pushed out this baby, you might get some bleeding in the brain. That's very rare. Um, typically, most of your precepts are just quick deliveries. Um, the biggest concern is that you might not have time to get a provider in there. If the provider who is um, taking care of this patient, if they're a private patient, let's say, um, for a doctor who is not in-house, there should be somebody, an OB, a resident, a midwife, somebody who is um, an independent provider who can de deliver that baby. Sometimes they just can't even make it into the room fast enough, and I've had that situation happen. And so you might have a nurse delivery. Okay. And if you have to be the one to deliver this baby, number one, get somebody else to help you in the room. Somebody's going to have to take care of mom and somebody else is going to have to take care of baby. Hopefully the provider is on the way. The main thing that you're going to want to do is to support the perineum. Let me see if we can find a picture of that for you. Okay, and here I have, um, this is actually a really good picture because it's used on a task trainer mannequin. You can see... Um, the provider's right hand is supporting the perineum, that skin between the vagina and the rectum, um, and putting some pressure, very gentle pressure on babies. You're not pushing the baby back in by any means, but you put a little bit of pressure on that fetal head to keep it from delivering in one big explosive motion, which can cause injury to both baby and mother. Um, sometimes when your contractions are this forceful and the urge is that strong, you don't want that head to just come bursting through like that and then flopping out. Um, so you're going to want to put just that very gentle pressure. Again, you are not pushing on the baby's head hard enough to try and push it back in there. That's not the objective. The objective is to have a smooth, steady delivery um, rather than an explosive one. So let me get rid of that picture. Um, that is what you would do. Now, after the head delivers, you're going to feel around the neck for a cord. And let me find a picture of that. Now, I used another um, picture from a task trainer model just to show you what that would look like. Now what you're going to do if you feel a loop of cord, first of all you're telling mom don't push and somebody should be at her head saying blow, 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 blow so that she's not pushing while you're trying to figure out this cord situation. If you feel around the neck and you feel a cord, if it feels loose enough you slip it over the baby's head. That's called reducing a nuchal cord um, and then you can deliver the rest of the baby. If you can't, if it's really, really tight, hopefully you're not the only person in the room and there's a delivery table that somebody has opened up a kit, they can give you two Kelly clamps, um, which you will put around the cord or clamp the cord, and then you're going to cut in between them and you're going to pray to God you don't have a shoulder dystocia because now you've cut the baby's lifeline. Um, hopefully by this time you have a provider in the room who is, who is going to come in and take over that situation. Um, but... If you have the cord, you have to deal with it. Most of the time, they're loose. You slip them over. I've delivered maybe three babies, um, and one did have a loose nuchal cord. I just sn slipped it over. Um, I almost had to deliver one with a tight nuchal, but Dr. Barbella walked in and handled it. Um, I get very nervous because once you cut that cord, sometimes they don't come out all that quickly afterwards and you're looking at a baby who's maybe had a little oxygen deprivation. So you want to have a resuscitation team standing by. One of your phone calls should have been to somebody who's NRP certified who can get in there, whether it's nursery or NICU or whatever. Um, but that is what you would do. After you've um, done the cord, like I said, you can have mom push for the rest of the baby, hopefully the rest of it. Usually when they're coming out that fast, to be perfectly honest, they're almost always fine. It's the ones that take, you know, three and a half hours of pushing and then there's a vacuum and then the shoulders don't want to come out. Those are the ones you worry more about. Usually your precipitous delivery, if you support the perineum and don't let the head deliver explosively, you're okay. Um, and then you would do all the same things that a nurse would do in any other delivery. The next, uh, next topic we're going to talk about, it's a really brief topic, is post-term birth. And post-term birth is defined as birth after 42 weeks gestation. And you rarely see this in a woman who's had prenatal care because providers don't like babies to go after 42 weeks. What happens is the placenta ages. And you probably have a bigger than average baby because he's had two more weeks to cook. So let me find you a picture of what a post-term baby looks like. 
Okay, so here you can see how the skin is peeling on this baby. Um, the skin peeling is kind of the dead giveaway. They have lots of creases on their feet. This is something that you might have seen in um, your, concept, your concept media videos. Um, but they're usually big babies, and they're usually swimming in meconium because um, by 42 weeks they've passed that first stool. Um, so that's a post-term baby. The big, uh, big disadvantage to carrying that long, again, is that the placenta is aging, and sometimes you'll end up with an IUFD, an intrauterine fetal demise, after 42 weeks. Um, so we don't really like to encourage pregnancies to go that long. Um, and the big thing that you're going to do, again, if it's a huge baby, you might end up with a CPD, cephalopelvic disproportion, and it might be a C-section, or you might get a vaginal delivery. You would do all the same things you do for a normal baby. You're just going to assess for any kinds of um, utero placental insufficiency while mom is in labor. You know, look for those late D-cells. And um, if there's a reason to do a cesarean section, you're really not going to um, tolerate too much uh, time until that decision happens. So that's a post-term birth. Okay, our next topic is going to cover obstetrical emergencies, and these are, um, some of them are common, some of them are not. Um, but the first one we're going to talk about is shoulder dystocia, and that is um, common enough that if you talk to most every labor nurse, they will have encountered at least one. It's actually common enough where I work that we have a code for it. It's called a code green, and that is called overhead, and it mobilizes um, the necessary staff. If you need anesthesia there, if you need um, NICU there particularly, um, and any OB, if, you know, if you're doing a midwife delivery and you need like another OB, um, call the code overhead, and you'll get more hands than you need in that room, which is important. Okay, what happens with a shoulder dystocia is that the head delivers just fine, and then that head kind of turtles back in. It looks like it's being sucked back up. Um, and so you'll have the nozzle be buried sort of in the perineal tissue um, instead of having that head emerge and then that um, restitution and external rotation, you get that turtle sign. And what's happening in that delivery is that the shoulders are sort of stuck on the ischial spines in the pelvis, um, and the baby can't come down. And you have a delay in the... Um, delivery. Meanwhile, the baby's neck is sort of in the birth canal getting squeezed, and so you have um, the blood can't get to the brain. Um, it's like if you had somebody's hand on your carotid arteries. So, you know, it does become kind of an emergency. Um, and you need to act very quickly. You need to know what to do and not delay. Um, you can have the Events that happen after, if you don't get this baby out, you're going to have fetal asphyxia. You could have brachial plexus injury. Um, that's the nerve complex in the shoulder and the arms. You can have fractured clavicles. Um, and you end up with a baby who can be brain damaged or dead if it goes on long enough. Um, so let's talk about what you do about a shoulder dystocia. Let me find you a good picture of McRoberts' maneuver. So that's the first thing. Okay, so here is sort of a picture of McRoberts with the suprapubic pressure, which I'll talk about separately. But your McRoberts position, you have to start with the head of the bed completely flat. And what you are going to do is tilt that symphysis pubic upward. Um, if the mom's head is sort of upright or whatever, I mean, I know you all think upright is better, but in this particular instance, the head of the bed needs to be flat to tilt that symphysis pubis upwards and make more room for that shoulder. McRoberts' position is when the nurses, there's usually one nurse on each side, shoving, um, sort of putting a lot of pressure on that mom's foot and bringing that knee up to open that pelvic outlet as wide as possible. Um, you end up with her knees sort of almost by her ears. Um, and she needs to push hard. You need to maybe really get in her face and tell her, you need to push now and get the rest of your baby out. It's not her fault, but she can't think she's done because the head's out. Um, now, McRoberts will resolve some of that. In the meantime, the provider is sort of hooking their finger underneath the posterior um, shoulder and trying to deliver that. If McRoberts doesn't resolve this, you're going to apply what's called suprapubic pressure. Now, in this picture, she's going down, but in reality, what you're going to do is find out which way the head is facing and sort of nudge it downwards and sideways so that that shoulder can slip under the pubic bone and the provider can then deliver the shoulders, okay? Um, you have to really put your whole body weight into it. And where I work, they just purchased stools for everybody so that we had that angle. If some of us aren't that tall. We would have to jump up on the beds and do this. Um, 
and this is a situation where you need to get that baby out quickly and you maybe have family in the room um, and something that was a pretty calm, relaxed atmosphere suddenly becomes very serious and tense until that baby comes out. Um, if you have somebody in the room whose job it is to record, now when we call it code green, we get extra people. We'll usually have three or four nurses in the room and we'll have NICU there. Um, and if there's an, uh, another provider who can come and sort of assist as well, that happens. Um, but if you can have a nurse that just is your scribe and is recording events in the time that they happen, um, one thing that I used to do as a nursery nurse was hit that APGAR timer when I saw the head come out, and then I would have an accurate timing of exactly how long that baby was, um, the head was delivered before the shoulders came out. And if it's more than a minute and we use maneuvers, we called it a shoulder dystocia, um, even if we had a really good outcome. Um, so you'll want to know, you know, how long the baby's been down. Now, if these maneuvers don't work, you can go with something called a Woods Maneuver, um, which is like a corkscrew. The physician will try and turn the baby like a corkscrew. Um, it takes a lot of muscle. Let me see if I can find a picture of it for you. Okay, so here's a picture of that Woods Maneuver, which is the corkscrew. And what you're, corkscrew, what you're trying to do is rotate that baby. Now, if that baby's wedged in there, this is a tough job. It's hard to wedge, you know, unwedge a baby like that. Um, but a doctor who's had training in this, or a midwife, is going to try and um, rotate that baby so that that shoulder moves just enough to get that baby delivered. It could be in an occiput posterior position, but now that the head's out, that's not such a problem. But that's the woods maneuver. Now, by the time you're trying this, usually it's been more than a minute, maybe two minutes. Um, and this is, you know, time is brain. So let's get rid of this picture. There is another maneuver you can try, which is the Gaskin maneuver. Um, I haven't seen it used, but I have heard of people that um, I work with who've used it. And Gaskin, Ina Mae Gaskin was a midwife. Hold on, let me find a picture of it. Okay, and here is the Gaskin maneuver. And what you do is mom goes in all fours, and that kind of maybe changes the diameters of things and um, uses gravity to get that posterior shoulder out. Um, but so now you've tried McRoberts, and you've tried, you know, and you probably didn't try McRoberts right away. You waited until you saw the shoulders not come, so there's a few seconds there. You've tried McRoberts. You've tried suprapubic. You've tried getting mom to push harder. You've tried the Woods Maneuver. Maybe you get mom in all fours. You try the Gaskin Maneuver. Well, now you're looking at a baby. If you don't get the baby out with the Gaskin Maneuver, um, you're looking at a baby who um, might have already lost a lot of time. So... Um, you know, if these things don't work, I have heard of doctors, I've never seen it, thankfully, but you can fracture the clavicles. And now you don't have a shoulder that's caught up because you're, you know, you can sort of squish those shoulders now that they're broken. Um, so that is another thing that can be tried. Better a broken clavicle than a dead baby is the thinking behind that. Um, and then the last... Uh, Procedure of last resort, um, and I must hesitate to say this, but it's called the Zavanelli um, procedure. And Zavanelli procedure is a cesarean section where you go under the drape and you push up the baby's head. Um, it's not associated with good outcomes. It's associated with dead babies. By the time you have tried all the maneuvers and gotten mom back into the OR and got her under general anesthesia, and push the baby's head up, um, you don't get a good outcome from the Zavanelli procedure, but that is the maneuver of last resort. So that is your shoulder dystocia. The risk factors for shoulder dystocia, anything that makes a bigger baby, but particularly diabetes, um, because diabetes is associated with a bigger abdominal circumference, which will push your shoulders out. Um, Short women, um, women with smaller pelvises, but generally the head is the biggest part of the baby. So there's not a lot of good um, screening for shoulder dystocia. For a while, I think we had one group that was using what was called a comm screen, and it was basically based on whether or not the mom had diabetes and how tall she was and how big her last baby was. Um, but that is shoulder dystocia, and it is an emergency. It is something you will see fairly frequently in labor and delivery. Okay, so the next emergent condition that we're going to talk about is prolapse of the umbilical cord. And you can see in the picture, it's the um, presentation of the cord before the presenting part, which in this case is a head. 
Um, it can be a breach, um, but it's especially more um, emergent when it is the head because the head is harder than the buttocks and it will cause more compression of the cord. Um, okay, so the way that this is normally discovered is either you'll see some things on the monitor that are not reassuring. You'll see some very deep uh, variables or some prolonged decelerations of the fetal heart. Um, or mom will put her call light on and say, um, I think something's coming out of my vagina, and when you look, oops, there's the cord. They're not common, um, and the main cause of it is when mom's membranes rupture before the presenting parts engage. So you have a little room between the baby's head and the pelvic inlet, um, and the cord can just, boop, slip past. Um, so amniotomy does have this risk, and that's one of the reasons that when uh, mom's water break, we keep her on the monitor for about half an hour and just make sure a baby likes the environment um, without all that fluid. So that's what an umbilical cord prolapse is. So what does a discoverer do with this? Well, the first thing is you're going to, um, you probably discovered it by doing a vaginal exam. So the first thing that you're going to do is get that presenting part off of the cord. You're going to get a gloved, you know, you've got a gloved, sterile hand, and you're going to push on that head or on that breech um, so that there is room for the cord to pulsate. Um, you do not want to manipulate the cord too much. You don't want to cause vasospasm. That's one of the dangers. You don't want to try and replace it in the vagina. Um, you just want to get the pressure from the presenting part off. Now, if it's exposed to air, if it's outside the vagina, that Wharton's jelly is going to start to dry, and it's going to cause um, closure of the vessels. You don't want that. So one of the things, um, you're calling for help, and you're getting people in the room, if the cord is out of the vagina, you want to get some 4x4s and some sterile saline and moisten them um, and keep that cord slightly wet without too much manipulation. Um, and then what's going to happen is you need to position mom in such a way that it takes the, that it sort of um, takes the pressure of the presenting part off of the cervix. So the easiest, quickest way to do this, if you have a labor and delivery bed, um, or a bed that is capable of putting mom in Trendelenburg is to just hit that button that gets her in Trendelenburg fast. Now, your textbook, and I believe ATI had a question last year the seniors told me about, um, will say, will recommend the knee chest position. And the reason for that is that there was a study done. I actually went and looked it up. Um, but this study was done in a low resource country in Africa where they didn't have beds that could put mom in Trendelenburg. So um, knee chest was sort of the low tech resolution of this. It doesn't make it necessarily a better solution. Um, it does essentially the same thing. Um, but because it's the only evidence-based practice that's available, um, a lot of these textbook writers seem to have latched onto it um, without sufficient understanding that um, it's very hard to do randomized controlled trials on something that happens maybe once or twice a year at best in an American hospital. Um, but maybe in this country, maybe the preferred method of induction or augmentation was amniotomy. So maybe that, per that um, group of people who did this research see a lot more prolapse cords than we do, but maybe they don't have the technology because the other recommendation that they made was to deliver within 30 minutes. And I can tell you that nobody where I work would feel comfortable waiting 30 minutes with a prolapse cord. Um, so you've got the bed in Trendelenburg. You've got your hand in there. You're off the presenting part. You're not manipulating it. At this point, everybody's getting the C-section room ready. Um, hopefully there's two or three people in the back helping the scrub tech get the OR together. And there are people in your room helping you get this patient ready for a C-section, which includes placement of a Foley, because you don't want to wait. Once you've got her on the table, if you can get, uh, you don't want to wait too long to get that Foley in. So then what happens is they ride you down the bed. You are still kneeling on the mattress um, with the patient and hopefully they've covered you with a sheet so mom's naughty bits aren't out in the open. Um, it looks kind of funny if you've ever seen this in real life. It's I've never had to be the discoverer, but I have seen people I've assisted, and I've seen people run down the hall like this. You run down the hall in the bed um, with your hand in the vagina until you get to the OR. You get mom over to the OR table. Anesthesia should be waiting there because hopefully you have called everyone in sort of a code situation. We call it a code CB. Some hospitals um, just have ways of getting a hold of everybody. Anesthesia will be waiting to put in general anesthesia. This is not a situation where you have time to do a spinal um, anesthetic. If she has an epidural, they might not even do that. They might bolus the epidural and out comes the baby. Um, and you can usually accomplish delivery in less than 10 minutes. 
um, if it takes you six or seven minutes, that's about what um, my experience at my facility has been. Um, and so that is how you deal with a prolapse cord. And you can get a good outcome if you act quickly. So even though this doesn't happen very often, you might only have one of them in your career. You might never have them. Um, you need to know what to do because when it happens, you have no time to think. You have to, it has to be automatic um, response in your head. Um, so that is a prolapse cord. Now this is probably going to be our shortest topic of all. It's an amniotic fluid embolism, and the reason it's short is because you can't diagnose it unless you have an autopsy, which means you have a dead mom. Basically what an amniotic fluid embolism is is that at some point, either during or after the birth, some of that amniotic fluid breaks free and gets into maternal circulation where it can cause a pulmonary embolus. Okay? Um, and the signs and symptoms are very similar to any pulmonary embol embolus. You have a sudden um, dyspnea, you have chest pain, mom is maybe frothing at the mouth is what I have heard is the classic presentation. Um, you might have fetal cells, vernix, something in that amniotic fluid is lodged now in that mom's lung. She might have chest pain, shortness of breath. The only case I know of that we suspected amniotic fluid embolism in 14 years that I've been there happened at regional, was a Hispanic mom, no prenatal care, and um, she was in a C-section and coded. Now, it was general anesthesia, so she was already intubated, which would be the main intervention anyway. Um, so she was already intubated. If she were not, if she were a patient, let's say, you know, an hour after a vaginal delivery, all of a sudden had these signs and symptoms, you would want to get, um, call an adult code and prepare for intubation and assist with that. Um, generally speaking, most moms don't survive an amniotic fluid embolism. The woman that I referenced that happened at regional um, did survive only because she was already intubated, um, but they had to do chest compressions. It was not a good situation. Um, and so really don't worry too much about AFE because if you see it, you're probably not going to do a lot except for grief support for the family. Um, and that's amniotic fluid embolism. It's just something that might show up in NCLEX. Okay, the next obstetrical emergency we're going to talk about is uterine rupture. Um, and uterine rupture is uncommon, but it does occur. It is a life-threatening emergency. The, the fetal mortality rate with a uterine rupture can be up to 50 to 70%. Um, maternal mortality is at least five, um, but you can lose both mother and baby with a uterine rupture. And the greatest risk factor with a uterine rupture by far is a previous C-section. And this is why some doctors are, or providers are reluctant to do a VBAC, or vaginal birth after cesarean. And when you have a vaginal birth after cesarean, you have to monitor those moms very carefully. Um, and that's usually a case where you're not going to do any intermittent um, fetal monitoring. When you do an induction with somebody who is a, um, what we call a trial of labor after cesarean, or a TOLAC, um, it becomes a VBAC if they actually deliver vaginally. Um, but if you're inducing labor, there are certain agents you cannot use. You can't use Cytotec, and you can't use Cervidil, and you can't use Prepidil. Um, so you can't really ripen that cervix with those agents because it will soften um, the lower uterine segment, including the scar tissue over where the cesarean was. Um, you can only use Pitocin, and you can only use it in low doses. Um, and so it's a risky business to... Um, you know, have that VBAC. It's not necessarily contraindicated, and there are lots of people who will do it. There's lots of moms who have successfully had vaginal birth after cesarean. Um, but there are certain types of cesarean where it's more likely, including your classical incision, those vertical incisions um, in the uterus, because they're just more likely to tear. Yeah, he had lunch. Okay, sorry. Um, all right. Um, other risk factors are twin or other um, multiple gestations, especially the higher order ones, typically they don't tend to um, attempt vaginal delivery, but if they come in in active labor, you wanna uh, monitor for signs and symptoms of uterine rupture. Um, and anybody who has had any kind of um, uterine surgery, including like removal of fibroids, um, those people may have, might have some weakening of the myometrium. And um, tachycystole. Now, tachycystole is also a symptom 
Um, but if you have hyperstimulation of uh, the uterus during a, like a Pitocin induction or even during a natural labor, you are more likely to um, rupture your uterus because, you know, obviously you've got the force of those contractions acting against the muscle wall. Um, okay, so how do we know we have it? Well, there's typical um, fetal monitoring patterns, and I kind of showed you some um, in the fetal monitoring video. You get that sinusoidal pattern because the baby is losing blood, um, and you get the hyperstimulation of the uterus, um, those, that tachycystole pattern you will get. Um, mom will report this stabbing, searing pain, which is very different from typical labor pain. Um, labor pain can be intense. It can be described as um, uh, sometimes like cramping early and then it becomes like a sharper pain, but the quality of the pain with the uterine rupture is stabbing, searing. It is um, really a different character of pain. Um, mom feels like she's being torn up inside. Um, you're gonna get some vaginal bleeding. Um, mom will start to get to Kipnik. Oops. Tachycardia. She's going to start showing signs. Oops, sorry. Of hypovolemic shock. Um, so she's going to start looking like she's losing blood, even if you don't see um, an amount of blood that correlates with what your findings are. Um, you're going to get fetal... The fetal strip is going to look very non-reassuring. You're going to get maybe that sinusoidal pattern. Um, or you might get fetal tachycardia or bradycardia because the baby is now losing their blood supply. Um, and then you might get loss of fetal heart activity because um, that baby might... Um, end up being a demise. And then that baby is going to go up. If that baby was at um, zero station, that baby's gonna float up because now that uterus isn't pounding down on the baby or keeping him contained, it's open. Um, and so you have a loss of station, baby will now be uh, blottable or floating. Um, the only real resolution of this is going to be immediate cesarean delivery. Um, and you might end up with hysterectomy to save mom's life. Um, you definitely want to have a neonatal team there to resuscitate the baby if that's at all possible. Um, but really the key to this, you want to prevent it. If somebody um, has had a cesarean and you're um, working with that person, you need to educate them. If they start going into labor, they need to be um, seen immediately um, or if they rupture membranes. And definitely, if you are doing um, any kind of induction with somebody who um, has had previous uterine surgery, you need to really watch that strip carefully for any signs and symptoms and be checking on your patient frequently, assessing how their labor progresses and whether or not they're um, showing signs and symptoms. Um, some of the scariest inductions, I had one induction once with a provider um, who had twins and she was a VBAC. Her first baby was a singleton and breech and they wanted to attempt a VBAC with this mom who was now twins at term and it was really kind of dicey. I think we ended up leaving her pit at four MUs per minute which is a really really low dose because I was afraid to hyperstimulate her and she did have a run of tachycystole. It did kind of scare me so I ended up turning that pit off and bolusing her with some fluid and she did deliver vaginally and she did well. She did not rupture her uterus but that is the level of caution that you need to have. Okay, and the last um, condition we're going to talk about, it's not truly an emergency at the level of a prolapse cord or uterine rupture or shoulder dystocia. This is not one of those things that's going to have you um, on an adrenaline rush for the rest of your shift. But about 10% of babies will have um, past meconium in utero, and you'll get meconium-stained fluid. And the reason I include it with this um, is that baby can inhale some of that fluid with its first deep breath and get what's called meconium aspiration syndrome, which is a type of... Um, foreign body ammonia, and pneumonia, I'm sorry. Um, and so, you know, it's something that you as a labor and delivery nurse would want to be aware of. Um, sometimes meconium signals that baby has had some distress in utero, and so a vagal response, they've released 
um, meconium into the fluid. Sometimes you just get these post-dates babies and that happens. Um, but the way that we want to handle that is we want to um, make sure that we have staff on hand who can resuscitate the baby. So maybe your neonatology team at delivery. Um, we're going to make sure that that baby, that there's a meconium aspirator on the warmer. Um, and that's a little device that goes on the end of a suction tube. So what might happen, the neonatologist makes a call if the baby is not vigorous, he might intubate the baby and see if there's fluid below the cords and suck it out. Um, so you want to have that, you want to make sure you have a laryngoscope on your warmer um, with a zero blade or um, a zero zero blade. Um, and that would be something you would know, you know, don't worry too much about it. But basically just know that um, if a newborn inhales this fluid, they can get something called meconium aspiration syndrome. And so we just want to be aware and have preparations at delivery for it. Um, and you would note that that, that that was the color of your fluid at the time of rupture um, and move forward. But that is um, meconium fluid. That's really all you need to know about that. And so that is the end of Unit 10. Um, bring your questions to class. We'll really be covering, um, you know, I sort of tried to set it up so that we would do normal labor first with our electronic fetal monitoring, and then we would do um, interventions and um, risk um, in the second two sessions together. Um, so, you know, we'll be covering these over the next two class sessions. And um, if you bring your questions, we'll try and do some simulation activities to um, sort of cement some of this learning for you, because I think especially when we're dealing with emergent situations, um, it's really good to have a picture of where, um, how you would act. It's good to have that muscle memory of what you would do in that situation. All right, so thanks for your patience.